these issues even before the current crisis that we've been talking about that's sweeping America. But of course, this conversation just shows how prescient these warnings have been. This conversation is part of our ongoing initiative about poverty, jobs, and economic opportunity in America. It's called Chasing the Dream. Professor Mirsa Baradaran, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you so much for having me. So your latest book is called The Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap, and it's specifically about the role of black banks, but your work is so much more than that. One of the things that you say in the book is that the wealth gap is where historic injustice breeds present suffering. That this is rooted not just in slavery, but in the history immediately following slavery. How does slavery, which ended in 1865, have present-day consequences? One of the things I try to do in the book is to um, look at the myths that we tell ourselves about American capitalism and then kind of show the reality and show the gap between, right? So the myth is that once slavery was ended, there was sort of capitalism and free markets, and you know, that since then there's been equality. And the reality is, in, on the economic front, um, the, the American markets were not open and, and capitalistic and free, right? Um, specifically in the protection of black property, which was never there, exclusion from certain jobs and markets. So after um, the Civil War um, uh, and emancipation, instead of getting land, uh, the free slaves did not get right, did not get land, they got this um, savings bank. Um, they put their money in the savings bank, trusting it, um, thinking that it was backed by the full faith and credit of the federal government, um, which it was not. It was advertised to be, and they lost half their wages. And this is in a time of heavy segregation and um, uh, sharecropping, right? Sharecropping is an arrangement that is a debt arrangement. It was basically a freed slave going back to the plantation, some of which they had just sort of escaped from, and growing cotton in the same way they did under slavery, except they were no longer slaves. They were, you know, uh, sharecroppers of the land. They were tenants. And um, that was not a wealth building um, mechanism. Meanwhile, a lot of, you know, white um, Southerners and Westerners and Easterners were able to get um, benefits from the Homestead Act. If you look at, you know, the 1934 era um, New Deal measures, those are much more consequential to today. So what the 1934 FHA and GI bills did is sort of cement that racial segregation into law and policy. And what they did is go around drawing risk maps around the country. So this is before credit scoring or anything like that. And they said, look, if you live in this certain neighborhood, the risks are low, your property's going to gain value, and so we're going to insure your mortgage. And the way that they determine those neighborhoods is um, how white they were. So if you live in a white neighborhood and it continues and remains white, then you get your um, mortgage insured by the federal government. If you live in a black neighborhood or one that is uh, what they call racially inharmonious, meaning there were you know, other races living inside each other, then you are in a high-risk neighborhood, which meant that your, your mortgage was not going to be insured. So those maps are followed by banks and by private lenders well into 1950s, 1960s. And, and you, you have um, you know, contracts, uh, housing contracts, putting racial covenants in the contract. You have HOAs, you've got neighborhood associations, really just enforcing the boundaries of their neighborhood and excluding black and brown people. You make the argument that credit really creates wealth and that if African Americans are locked out of the credit system. It keeps them poor. Why is that? So I want to distinguish between good credit and bad credit, right? So good credit, you know, the FHA loans, the GI bills, the kind of stuff that is, you know, government subsidized guaranteed, low risk credit, 30 year fixed rate mortgage, things like that. That's good credit, right? So now you can pay, if you have a little down payment, you can pay basically less than you're paying in rent and you're building equity in a house. That's a good mortgage credit that builds wealth because then you're taking that little equity, that down payment that you put down and, and creating wealth because your property's going to increase if it's in a certain neighborhood or a student loan that is low cost. Um, you can use to go to college and then hopefully make some money and, and, and use that good credit. Bad credit is the stuff you know, we talk about payday loans and installment credit and, and subprime credit, high interest, high risk credit. So what you've had is a, you know, I call it a, a Jim Crow credit market that has developed on top of these segregatory patterns. And so what we've offered a lot of white communities since the New Deal to now is lower cost credit, right? And then to black communities, it's been installment credit, subprime credit um, that sort of blew up in those spaces, and credit that is not wealth building. So I want to distinguish credit, um, the two types of credit. So we're not just talking about all access is good access, right? So just, you know, payday lending is not good. You make the point that white immigrant groups have at points in their history faced the same kinds of restrictions that black people have. I mean, access to labor locked out of lending institutions. They were segregated in certain neighborhoods at some point. But you say that they've had a very different trajectory. You know, what, tell me more about that. In fact, you, saw, you cite the Bank of Italy as an example, <laughs> which was formed when Italian immigrants faced discrimination and were ghettoized. What happened there? A very different history than that of most of the banks that arose to serve black people. What happened there, and why so different? If you look at the Bank of Italy's example, it really does show the disparate impact, the disparate sort of um, trajectories of the two different races. So, uh, Italians and Irish, uh, many other foreign-born Arabs, you know, uh, uh, Mexican uh, immigrants, all sorts of people were also non-white. Some are still non-white, but um, looking at um, Italians and Irish specifically, kind of just shows how how these markets and sort of whiteness um, work. So, um, but pre sort of New Deal, let's say, um, Italians and Irish were also excluded in the way that blacks were. Although, um, if you look at segregation patterns, it was never quite as stark. So, when you look at the black um, segregation patterns in, in certain spaces, blacks were much more segregated than Italians and Irish. But they were Italians and Irish were excluded from a lot of these um, these things. But post FHA, um, post sort of New Deal credit, Italians and Irish sort of get included in that American suburban credit market. So they do get the GI Bill. They're not restricted from certain colleges. They are able to buy in communities that are, you know, suburbs that are able to um, grow equity. And then so you look at Bank of Italy. Um, Bank of Italy starts as a bank, just like a lot of the black banks that I highlight in the book, as a response to exclusion. So when you have a black community or an Italian community excluded from the mainstream credit system, what happens a lot is that the entrepreneurs within the community establish their own bank. So Bank of Italy establishes because Italians aren't getting banked by other mainstream institutions. But once Italians do become part of this FHA and GI Bill um, credit, Bank of Italy is able to thrive and, and um, survive. And it's in California, it's in San Francisco, and there's a lot of really great economic sort of um, tell-ins. And so uh, Bank of Italy then becomes sort of you know, Bank of California, and then it is now Bank of America. Wait, wait, Bank of America started as the Bank of Italy? I mean, Bank of America is a consortium of a bunch of different banks. But yes, it starts Bank of Italy that becomes, it turns into Bank of America. And, and really, I mean, so do Italians. Right? Italians are Americans, as are all of us. But I think looking at the way that that bank works really shows uh, how certain immigrant communities have been um, included and others uh, have not. You also give a case study of the fact that is true is, and I've said this publicly, so I'm not you saying anything that's, that's classified in any way, um, our capacities to scoop up information mm -hmm. became so great. And traditionally, there haven't been restraints on our intelligence community scooping up information from outside our borders <laughs> and non-U.S. persons. And mm -hmm. so what ended up happening was is that in places like Germany, uh, this had a huge impact not just on government-to-government -government relations, but suddenly all the Silicon Valley companies that are doing business there find themselves challenged, in some cases, not completely sincerely, because some of those countries have their own companies who want to displace ours. Mm -hmm. I, I say all this to, 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 to make the point that uh, I think we have made real progress in uh, narrowing the differences around the national security privacy balance.
Era 